Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Neil Besner. I'm the Provost and Vice President Academic here at the University of Winnipeg. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to what I know from past experience will be a superb address and a resonant part of this academic community celebration, marking a most significant milestone in the life of our institution, the University of Winnipeg's 100th convocation. Some months ago, our President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Lloyd Axworthy, and our Chancellor, Bob Silver, led us in conceiving a vision for this auspicious occasion. Included as a key element in the group's plans was our intention to invite a distinguished member of the Canadian academic community to come to Winnipeg to speak with us about the current and future state of Canadian universities, with a particular focus on one of our keen interests, which is the future of education in the humanities and social sciences, which has been a subject that the President's task force on our future has been thinking about with considerable energy and commitment during the last year and a half. So it took us very little time, in fact, no time at all, to agree strongly that Dr. Antonio Maioni was the ideal speaker we sought for this occasion. And I'm delighted today that she's with us, and you soon will be as well. Bienvenue, Antonia, chez nous à l'Université du Winnipeg. C'est notre très grand plaisir. Bienvenue. I first met Antonia at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada in 2001-2002, where she was the director of that most excellent organization that I was visiting for the year. It quickly became apparent that not only was Antonia a most able director and a terrific boss, and then is now widely recognized for her expertise in Canadian health policy, just as importantly she was then and is now, as many in Quebec and across the country know, a fluently bilingual, bilingue, eloquent, incisive, and astute commentator on Canadian politics, frequently appearing on CBC Radio and TV, on CTV, in the Globe and Mail, and elsewhere. She's widely published in the field of health policy and a distinguished member of the political science department of the Canadian Studies Program at McGill and of the International Masters in Health Leadership Program in the Dissotel Faculty of Management. She's held visiting appointments at Harvard Center for European Studies, at Duke, at the Euro European University Institute in Fiesole, Italy, and she's taught at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University in New York City. Dr. Maioni also has a distinguished record of service. She served on the boards of the Institute for Research on Public Policy and the Priory School of Montreal, the McCord Museum of Canadian History, as well as on the executive of the Banff Forum. She's currently on the board of the Canadian Health Services Research Foundation. As well, she works as an advisor in the Action Canada program and as a mentor for the Canadian Merit Scholarship Foundation and the Jean Sauvé Foundation. So you can well understand that it was Canadian post-secondary education's great good fortune that Antonia recently, last March, became president of the Canadian Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, or CFHSS as it's known, and that in this capacity, Dr. Maioni has been speaking eloquently and persuasively to Canadians about the realities of our university system, its strengths, its possibilities, its future. Most recently, I heard her give a talk last April at the University of Regina on this very subject, and this to an audience full of carping VPs, because that's our nature, from across Western Canada, all of whom came away, as I did, impressed and moved, because Antonia had at her fingertips not only the facts and the data, but also a vision for the institution and the enterprise at large that was as compelling as it was persuasive. So today she's going to speak to us about the social sciences and humanities and their future in Canada. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Antonia Maioni. Merci beaucoup, Neil. On s'ennuie de, de toi à Montréal. Euh, je ne sais pas si vous, toi, tu t'ennuies de nous autres, là, mais euh, on a amené le Canadien juste pour toi cette semaine. Je ne sais pas si ça marche. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil. That was a very kind introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be back in Winnipeg. Uh, we call it the heart of Canada, and it is becoming one of my favorite places. And it's most of all an honor to speak at this important time in your university's history. Et j'aimerais féliciter en fait tous ceux et celles qui prendront part à la centième assemblée de demain parce que je crois que c'est un moment important pour tout établissement d'enseignement 
euh, et sûrement, surtout les enseignements euh, d'enseignement supérieur. C'est aussi une étape charnière, en fait, dans votre histoire et qui mérite d'être soulignée. Alors, félicitations à vous tous. Congratulations to everyone who was involved in the 100th convocation. This is indeed an important milestone. And uh, on behalf of the Federation Humanities and Social Sciences, I'm honored to be here and to be part of that as well. I know that the convocation is about looking at the past. It's 100 years that you'll be celebrating. Um, but I'm inspired to learn of the efforts of those who, right here in Winnipeg, continue to build for the future including your president, uh, Lloyd Axworthy. And Mr. Axworthy, I think that in Canada we don't do this enough, which is to celebrate uh, who we are and what we do. But I'd like to, on the behalf of the Federation, say thank you for all that you've done for the University of Winnipeg in terms of social science and humanities, and more broadly speaking, for Canada as a whole. So thank you very much. In his recent address, um, President Axworthy actually spoke very eloquently about the mission that we have in the university to create a new learning culture, one that better prepares young women and men to succeed in today's world. Et en fait, nos établissements d'enseignement supérieur doivent conserver leur pertinence et être à l'avant-garde, sans quoi nous ne serons pas en mesure de préparer les étudiants aux rigueurs et aussi aux merveilles qui leur réservent le 20e siècle. I especially applaud President Axworthy's belief in the importance of promoting the value of the arts and of the humanities and in integrating them into all aspects of the university experience. And that's precisely, as Neil mentioned, what I want to talk about uh, here today. I'm a professor of the social sciences. I wear uh, that title proudly um, because I think that uh, as a professor of the social sciences, myself and my colleagues understand the challenges we face as teachers, as researchers, as students, and as leaders. These are challenges that are faced across uh, universities and within universities, pressures on budgets, pressures on human resources, institutional issues, curriculum issues, we're asked to do more, to contribute further, uh, we're asked to put our, our nose to the grindstone and our shoulders to the wheel in addressing the skills shortage, etc. Um, and we're always being provided with fewer resources to do that. But on the flip side is I'm very much energized by the fact that despite all of these travails, in a, in a way, our universities continue to achieve. We continue to reach more people, we continue to create new programs, we continue to conduct more and groundbreaking research, and we're evolving. Uh, really, universities in Canada are a work in progress to better serve the needs of today's students and the society that they live in. And I'm so proud to serve as president of the Federation because we believe that in advancing equity, diversity, knowledge, excellence and innovation, we are contributing to not only to our students as people, but to an open, vibrant and innovative society. We actually promote this idea through our new slogan, like I have to put a uh, plug into it, which is ideas can, les idées peuvent. Ideas can make a difference. Ideas can move us forward. And I think there's power in the ingenuity of the universities to be able to do that. And to our students who become leaders and contributors uh, in society. I'm speaking to the converted when I say that post-secondary education facilitates public debate by providing impo important knowledge as a public good. But I think we want to re recall that it's all the universities in Canada that play that critical function through supporting and nurturing our communities of scholars and researchers. We really are an essential part of the public debate. Uh, we can't be shut down uh, because we are uh, actually really important to the future of an open and democratic society. And yet, we hear voices all the time from those who see our work in the university and more particularly our disciplines in social sciences and humanities as increasingly irrelevant. And we tend in our own little corners to roll our eyes, scoff, dismiss this viewpoint, um, but that won't make it go away. And instead, I believe we really do have to find a voice and to use that voice to speak loudly about the virtues of arts, humanities, and social sciences and the benefits they instill in the students they reach and the society that they own. And as you know from within the academy, we're not always our best, our own best advocates. We have our own divisions inside this ivory tower. I remember talking to my PhD advisor as I was finishing my dissertation 
and saying, oh, I don't know if I want to spend the rest of my life in an ivory tower. It sounds like it's you know, just a little bit too peaceful for me. And he said, my dear, you don't know anything about politics unless you've actually worked in a university. So he thought being a political scientist, uh, the, the PhD was not going to cut it. What was really going to be is working in the university and seeing politics in its rawest and sharpest form. I'm sure President Axworthy can tell us uh, that he has battle scars from both kinds of politics that he's lived through. But I think that we have to actually harness something that we have uh, as an atu, uh, that is our own students, who go out and become, I think, emblematic of the kinds of things that we're trying to do, people who've built successful careers, fulfilling lives, uh, and they have actually taken their university education and understand the real benefits of what we do. And we have to also come back to ourselves and be able to make those kinds of arguments. The first kind of argument I want to make is an economic argument. Um, I know that we have naysayers that say, no, don't go there, don't try to fight that battle, talking about social sciences and humanities or even universities in terms of the real economic challenges and the real economic opportunities that exist in our resource-rich country today. We hear that we're graduating too many university uh, students, that we have too many BAs out there, not enough welders, and that our universities have become a place of irrelevance. Uh, my favorite is my colleague Margaret Wente talking about how we train learned baristas. Well, for the record, I actually waitressed my way through college. Uh, it wasn't Starbucks back then, it was uh, Smitty's, but I'm a better person for having done so. And also for the record, I went to university and I broke my father's heart uh, by not going to college. In that case, it was Secretarial College. He knew, and I knew, that I would be guaranteed a job coming out of a two-year Secretarial College program, but I decided not to go there. He eventually got over it, and so did I, because I found in my BA education a solid foundation to build lifelong skills that have kept me in good stead since then. And yet here we are, decades later, we're still talking about these false dichotomies in these economic issues references to skill shortages, gaps in labor markets, mentions of Canada's current rate of youth unemployment and stagnant productivity, and seeing that as the fault of universities, rather than thinking about how universities can actually turn that around. I think that a BA, and you all know this, the education it requires and the beneficial qualities that it helps produce may be less tangible than certain disciplines, but boy, do they ever matter to the Canada of the future. We have to really come out and say it. We impart wisdom. We impart self-awareness, understanding. We equip young people and older people with the knowledge and the context to make decisions, to broaden horizons, to be able to make judgments, to be able to look over their actions, and in so doing, to contribute to the improvement of society we share in this country that we all love. And we give our students and we give ourselves the flexibility and nimbleness to create and inhabit and own the next generation in the 21st century and beyond. So I think that in terms of answering those economic arguments, we just have to remember that the skills crisis may be real, but we can't be blinded by it as a, an immediate skill shortage. There are profound labor shortages that have developed over time, but that's what labor markets do. They change, they develop, they move on. And universities and colleges can play a role both in meeting the present needs and in preparing for the needs uh, of the future. We know already that there's a midterm human capital shortage on the horizon. Employers are telling us that they need more university graduates, not less. And the global competition for talent is intensifying across the globe. We don't have to, I think, as universities, and in particularly in the arts and social sciences, f feed that tuition debt jobs narrative. Students and their parents are bombarded with these messages. Tuition is too high, you'll graduate with debt, there are no jobs. These are corrosive mess messages and they also happen to be unfounded and what they're doing now is undermining what was, what is hopefully still, Canada's greatest competitive strength, which is uh, the education of our, of our youth. And I'm especially concerned with criticisms that we have too many graduates. Uh, 
And the truth is that we still have an access issue in post-secondary education in Canada. Canada actually ranks 20th in university attainment among the industrialized countries. And despite our own uh, enrollment growth, other countries are growing their university system at an even greater pace than Canada's. These countries are investing in their young people and in their young minds as a way of sharpening their competitive edge. We were a leader 30 years ago among the industrialized countries in university attainment rates. Today, we stand at 20th. 20th. This suggests that our competitive advantage is beginning to erode and that our peer group, are now our competitors, from both developed and emerging nations are overtaking us. In fact, Canada has a significantly larger proportion of college graduates than most of these uh, industrialized countries and about three times more post-secondary non-university graduates. So in essence, we've chosen to invest more at the college level than most other developed nations. And that, in and of itself, is a good thing. Many Canadians benefit, and Canada benefits, from the kind of post-secondary education that these colleges provide. But it's important at the same time to recognize that you can't do that and not invest in universities if you really want to be at the forefront of economic and in economic innovation and other advantages for our future. In this context, then, I think it's logical to ask, what about the specific economic value of a BA in humanities or social sciences? And here, again, we're faced with a lot of data and a lot of reports that, as academics, we should be able to confront and unpack and dismantle if we have to. That's our job. That's our day job, right? We should also bring that to bear with what we hear in the media and elsewhere. For example, the CIBC World Markets study that hit the headlines in August um, showed that there is a long-term economic value to post-secondary education. A bachelor's degree pr provides 30% earnings and premium of earnings over a high school diploma. Advanced degrees a further 15%. Over the lifetime, a premium translates into over 1.3 million in additional income for someone who has a BA and 1.8 million for someone who has a master's degree. But the way that this was interpreted, and bizarrely the way the CIBC actually framed the report, was that students are making bad economic decisions by opting for degrees in the humanities and social sciences. But the own evidence, the evidence in that report, doesn't bear that out. There's a great deal of economic value to a university education in our disciplines. In fact, for a woman with a bachelor's degree in the humanity, the average return on investment is 10%. I don't know about you, but that's a lot better than any portfolio I've been involved with recently. And in the, in the social sciences, the return on investment is even higher. So the statistics that are out there, I think, have to be understood properly. And it's our job uh, to be, to I think, to do that, not only for our students, but also for the Canadian conversation about the future of universities and the future of social sciences and humanities. We know that the employers who are looking towards the future recognize that the humanities and social sciences graduate students who possess curiosity, communication skills, and creative insight that is needed in all workplaces across the country. We know, too, that there has been, in terms of the job growth since the 2008 recession, many, many thousands and thousands of new net jobs for university graduates, many more for university graduates than for college and trades graduates, and that the real losers since 2008 have been people who have chosen not to go on to post-secondary education, that is to say, staying just with a high school uh, degree. The problem, I think, is that for social scientists and humanists, they might want to call themselves as they get out of school. The greater challenge is what you do over a life course. Sure, finding full-time employment right after the BA is challenging. I have this challenge with the undergraduates that I mentor. I'm sure you have that challenge with the ones that you mentor or your own children for that regard. But the data really does show that after a few years, anyone coming out of a university with a BA, humanities and social sciences, have surpassed all of their college uh, compatriots, all of their high school compatriots, sometimes even some of their science compatriots, though I'm not going to take sides here, uh, in terms of employment and earnings. And so these are significant margins uh, to be had with that kind of a degree. Nevertheless, whether it's social sciences or sciences, university graduates are in demand everywhere. One of the things that social science and humanities brings to that mix is the need for critical thinking, writing, research, problem-solving, sharp and nimble thought. 
These are not skills that are going to go out of style anytime soon. There is a policy challenge in facilitating, facilitating a seamless move from the university to the workforce. That's why we have more and more experiential learning. I know that you're doing that here at the University of Winnipeg. In Winnipeg, at McGill, we have an arts internship program that is off the charts in terms of popularity, both with students and with the businesses and NGOs that they choose to do internships in. So we really do have to, I think, work towards breaking down some of these false uh, dichotomies, some of these arguments that we hear. Uh, and also, but this is going to sound really corny in a prairie uh, atmosphere, this whole idea of silos. I know that probably comes from the University of Winnipeg. This is where that originated, right? But it's true that the collaboration between universities has to be a factor. My colleague Chad Gaffield uh, from Shirk calls it about he uses the metaphor about standing shoulder to shoulder. And in that respect, we all have to, as universities across Canada, whether we're urban universities or provincial universities or all of the universities across Canada really do have to make some effort at that kind of, uh, of power in numbers, just as our funding councils are doing uh, in Ottawa. There's also something else that we need to be more and more proud to highlight, and that's the economic benefit of universities and colleges to their cities. So let me just boost Montreal a bit, because I know I'm in a city of boosters, but if you look at Montreal, a city that has four universities, I can attest to the fact that that ch changes the complexion of the urban core. Um, you might call it the joy of a brainy society, you might call it marching in the street, whatever it is, it brings a certain kind of an energy to everything that happens in Montreal. And you all know this to be true in Winnipeg as well. That's because of the talent that universities nurture in these urban areas, the young people that they attract, the stature they confer. Universities really do help make a city great. And there's a very real economic, social, and cultural impact of what we do in the buildings that we build, uh, but also in what we can impart as researchers and teachers. The University of Winnipeg, to me, is today a great multicultural city. It really does seem like the whole world lives in Winnipeg. And your success has been in building and sustaining the relationships with the cities that you live in. The Oral History Center, the important projects with First Nations and Métis communities, the partnerships with the city's cultural organizations, the Winnipeg Art Gallery, the Winnipeg Symphony, the Arts Fest, the joint programs with the Winnipeg Technical College, uh, the interdisciplinary and community collaboration through Richard, the Richardson College for the Environment, and something I find very, very exciting, the natural pathway from high school to university, the University of Winnipeg Collegiate, right here, right in the middle of your beautiful campus. So, felicitations, congratulations to all of you here, president, vice president, former presidents, deans, faculty, staff, and students for these remarkable achievements. And I hope that um, Despite all the misleading and corrosive warn warnings about universities, that we can still believe uh, that there's a future for them. And I think one of the, one of the uh, clues that that's happening is that enrollments remain high. So I think there's something about young people in Canada is that they actually get it, right? They're tuned in. They're on the cutting edge of what's going on in the world around them and on the wider world as well. They understand that there's a value in the kind of education that universities confer and the way that they can develop their skills and ability. They know that they need to be rapid, flexible, nimble, and they know they've gotten it, that universities can give them that kind of a future that can open them up to lifelong learning and employment opportunities. I think uh, in law we would say QED, that I've hoped to make the case to validate the, hum the humanities and social sciences in economic terms, but it would be a waste to say that that's the only thing that we do in universities because, of course, that's just the tip of the iceberg. The universities and the education that universities can give are about more than the bottom line. It's about understanding the world around us and to be able to respond to it. And I think that at the end of the day, in terms of our legacy to the future, that's probably even more important than the economic uh, bottom line. But I think the challenge is 
to make sure that we understand that there's no single formula for prosperity that is only based on an economic bottom line, that society is dyna too dynamic, the future is too unforeseeable. We have so many new ideas, technologies that are coming towards us that we can't even figure out. We, won't, we can't even imagine, I don't think, what the future holds uh, and what will be success. How will we define success in 10, 20, uh, 30 years' time? We're living in a transformational age. We produce so much data. Uh, we literally don't know what, it, what to do with it and often don't do the right thing with it. That's the other thing that we've learned. The only way we can understand to harness that data is, I think, to imagine the world through the lens of the kind of rigor and discipline and the kind of twinning that with the kind of visionary um, research that we can do uh, in a university setting. And that vision does have to include uh, arts education. We teach students how to learn. I don't think that that's an, uh, uh, an old-fashioned sense of what we're trying to do. I think that is something that they will be able to use no matter what happens in the future. We equip them the tools that will last a lifetime, but we also help shape them as citizens. And that's the other thing that universities do that we should not be shy about saying. We help provide, we help provide citizenship. We help, in effect, to allow people to realize their potential in society as citizens. One of the most important challenges, I think, that is coming forward to us in this IT revolution is how prepared we are as Canada, in Canada, to fully plunge into digital society as communicators, uh, even as pedagogues. What, well, how will that change what we do in universities as well? I recently discussed, was discussing with a graduate student something, and I realized that she had no idea what a card catalog was. She had no idea what a punch card was for statistics. And I'm thinking to myself, I did my research, the, the way I did my research in graduate school what had more in, in common with monks in the 13th century than it does with the way she does her research today. And I think that's true across most disciplines, right? We are actually, all of us, from the Middle Ages as far as research and technology and innovation is concerned. So we have to make sure that we are able to make sense of this, of what what our own students are facing in the future and um, their expectations as well and of those who are hiring them. And finally, I think to remember that humanities and social sciences provide us with pathways to the substance of thought and something that, again, may sound a little old fashioned, but I think it really resonates, particularly in this beautiful environment here at the University of Winnipeg, the shape and meaning of the good life or a good life. Un monde sans art, sans littérature, sans histoire n'est pas envisageable. Nos disciplines jouent un rôle essentiel, car nous ne savons pas qu'est-ce qui nous attend en tant que civilisation. Les disciplines dans les sciences sociales et humanités nous permettent d'analyser les changements dans nos sociétés, de mieux comprendre comment nous sommes rendus ici et de former, de nourrir une imagination éduquée quant au chemin possible à emprunter. The educated imagination, that's what we're after. I'd like to conclude by echoing the University of Winnipeg's own words in the window on the world. Discover, achieve, belong. These words speak to a growing intensity of commitment on the part of the University of Winnipeg and I think in universities across the country. We need to recast our thinking and to recognize the inherent importance complementarity and interdependence of all of us in this beautiful academic pursuit. We need to, I think, get beyond these false dichotomies, talk about humanities and engineering, universities and colleges. We can no longer fail to recognize the contributions across disciplines, or narrow our existence, or atomize what we do. I think one, one, one of the things we need to understand is to celebrate how universities, and within those universities, the arts and social sciences, really do develop our abilities to empathize, to understand, and to really focus on what is a truly human characteristic and will always be what humans have to give the world, our inherent curiosity and imagination. 
So I intend to do this. I think President Axworthy intends to do this, but I'm hoping that everyone will be energized in changing the tenor of the debate about the future of universities, about the role of, of the arts, social sciences and humanities, and to imagine what a good society in Canada and the world can look like, and the valuable, essential contribution of our disciplines to its future. Thank you, merci beaucoup, miigwech. Well, okay, so I, I'm thinking about this in the context of Manitoba and not necessarily in the context of Montreal, but um, yeah, no, no, I, it, so here's the thing, here's the thing. The larger universities have a larger kettle of fish to deal with, right? So in a sense, a large university that has a medical school, for example, uh, a very large graduate school, uh, professional schools that demand a lot of attention, a lot of money, a lot of watering and feeding, uh, means that often disciplines like my own, perhaps disciplines like yours, uh, get overlooked, uh, not celebrated for what they do, uh, but also that we tend, as lar those kinds of large universities, to not recognize what other kinds of universities can do in the mix. But if I take my own city as a, an example, some of the most vibrant and cutting edge research that is actually matters in the community is not necessarily happening at McGill. I know this is being taped, but uh, it's happening at other universities that are understanding the connection between what universities do and the impact they can have on society. Part of the problem is that large universities don't measure impact in the same way that the world as a whole and frankly, taxpayers are beginning to measure impact about what universities do. Whereas I think that urban universities, uh, universities that are able to be more nimble and flexible, are very much more capable of doing that. Glenn Molaison, uh, BA, class in 88. Uh, in, in French. Uh, I thank you very much for your comments. Uh, uh, and as you said at the beginning of your presentation, uh, you're preaching, you feel like you're preaching to the choir. And I, I think that's true in, in many cases uh, that we, we ourselves all make those arguments. We publish small articles here and mm -hmm. there regarding the value of arts and humanities uh, and social sciences. Uh, and uh, we try to make those arguments, and often they are not heard, of course, uh, by the people who should be listening, like governments, federal governments, provincial governments, and so on, the people who are responsible for funding universities. But w a couple of arguments that one doesn't hear uh, it often is, uh, is we are not tr uh, training just employees for the market. We are training, we are creating leaders of society and that's something we, we often don't hear. And that's one, one point I wanna make and I'd like to hear your comments on that. And the second one is, I think you use not the Fry's term, the educated imagination. That's what uh, universities and arts and humanities education is for, to, to, to create an educated imagination. It goes back to his big Massey lectures in mm -hmm. the 1950s or 60s, 63. Um, and author Fry also said once in a, in a university convocation address that uh, the argument that the universities and university people live in ivory towers and that the people out there 
are the people who are in touch with reality should be reversed. The people out there um, believe that they live in a world that is in touch with reality, but the real reality is being created here within universities. This is what is real. This is what a real society, an ideal society should look like. And out there, that's the, the ivory tower. So um, that's often, again, an argument that one doesn't hear. We have a great example of that, actually, um, uh, in Quebec, right? So our quiet revolution was fueled in many ways by the development of a higher education structure uh, that didn't exist before. Uh, so the whole goal of, for example, the University of Quebec system was to make higher learning accessible, relevant, uh, but also to train a new generation of leaders, right? That was the whole, and, and that had started already with the sciences and humanities at Laval. I'm a graduate of Laval uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s. There's no way that that whole um, important moment in Quebec and Canadian history would have happened without that kind of investment and understanding in the importance of universities and in their accessibility. So I think that's part of, I guess, the idea of what you can do with an imagination, what you can do when you actually impart skills that you don't know how they're going to be used in the future, but that will, will, will ultimately uh, build the leaders that you need to undertake this uh, vast and transformative change. The thing is, we already know that we're in the middle of a revolution, right? We're in the middle of an information revolution. We're in the middle of a uh, global revolution about rights and values. We're in the middle of a lot of, we're in the middle of a democratic revolution right here in Canada. And we also know that we can't really face those challenges by one discipline or one answer alone. I work on health policy, for example, and I know for a fact, and most people who study the health sciences will tell you, you know, the, how do we manage uh, an aging society? How do we actually make sense of what's going on in some of these ethical questions about right to, life, right to die legislation that's coming up? All of these things are not about sciences. They're not even about medicine. They're about sociology and the law and culture and all kinds of things. So that's the other thing I really, sometimes I'm, I'm wondering why this is so hard to grasp. That the big questions that we need leadership on are all questions that have to do with what we do inside of universities, right? This is what we train our students to be able to manage in the future. You referred previously to the CIBC study, but um, I wonder if you have thoughts about the dialogue that takes place between universities and the government of universities and political parties. Again and again, I've seen, um, or at least in the newspaper, um, directions to universities to become functional to the economy. And if you read those documents at face value, there'd be no reason why one would ever read a poem or listen to a, a a piece of music or a look at art or anything like that. It's relentlessly functional, relentlessly uh, make this into the economy. Can there be or how can there be more dialogue either with government or with political parties who, um, who are, will be our important spokesmen or spokespersons in terms of funding universities and things like that and not funding them in such a way that it has to be just a relentless uh, economic machine that, that they will understand uh, what, what you're offering in this address. Yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? No, and I, I, I understand perfectly. It can't just be about the economic argument. And as I said, I think the economic argument is the tip of the iceberg about what we do in universities. But I don't think we can not be part of a conversation that deals with economic issues. So. The only way we are going to be able to shape policy, future policy, is to be able to engage on that particular. And it, for me, it's not a stretch, right? So it's not as if we're making stuff up. This is actually true. <laughs> so why not, in fact, use that as a lever to be able to capture policymakers' attention, um, and in addition, be able to bring to bear the real strength of what a university is, which is about the educated imagination, which is about building a better citizen. 
But at the end of the day, if we all we have that economic argument as well, and I mean, even I think it was today in uh, in the Globe, my colleague Conrad, uh, you know, the kinds of incremental uh, changes that we make to sort of make our workforce fit the jobs of today is short-sighted in terms of what we really need to do, which is to make our economy function better for the future, right? That takes a lot more work. That takes a lot more investment. That takes a lot more insights. And that's going to take a lot more university-trained graduates uh, who can make that jump into a new economy. Hi, um, I work in, in health informatics, and um, so health informatics is interdisciplinary, as you know, brings uh, medicine, business, and engineering, computer science. Um, and one of the challenges that I found in many projects is that they fail because um, we don't understand the holistic view, the different perspectives uh, in healthcare. Um, so the, my question is, so is do you see a future for an, um, a holistic uh, discipline or career or profession where you um, migrate all the different disciplines together, like uh, humanities, social science, engineering, medicine, so that you have a more holistic students in the future instead of uh, you know disciplines in uh, computer science, engineering, and so forth? So uh, personally, yes, and I think more generally. So um, at McGill, I belong to something called the Institute for Health and Social Policy, which, I mean, from, this is huge for McGill, right? It's um, an institute that is jointly with the Faculty of Arts and the Faculty of Medicine. It's like never been done before, right? Uh, and one of the interesting things about that coming together uh, is A, how difficult it was institutionally, but B, how energized everyone the researchers are in the mix, right? So right now we have a huge project on diabetes, which is, you know, political scientists are involved, the philosophers are involved, uh, the epi and biostats people are involved. So I think there is, in effect, a hunger, thirst, for researchers to be able to gain or glean insights from each other to be able to attack uh, important questions or be able to move along in terms of answering important questions. So I think part of the struggle is not at the research side or even at the student side. The students just eat this stuff up. I teach a course in health policy and political science and I have like, I, it's like management students, science students, it's electives, science students, law students, students from all over the university, environmental sciences, because they really want to know about how policy making happens in the healthcare field, right? So I think the thirst is there, uh, the willingness is there. There's something about the institutional structures that sometimes make it more difficult. Uh, there's something about funding structures that make it more difficult. We're going through that now between SHRC and CIHR. It's kind of the birthing pains, and they're quite intense. Um, but I think that we're, we already know that this, there's, it's like there's no turning back, right? This is the way forward. The challenge is, as I said, the institutional structures, and also for our colleagues and the members of our faculties or departments who may not see the immediate win for them to help them understand how, in effect, this is something that is crucial to the future of research right, and to the universities. Thank you, Neil. Merci beaucoup. Merci à vous tous.